Previously, we discussed the importance of ATP to the metabolism of a cell. Everything that the cell needs to accomplish in terms of work is accomplished because of the presence of this molecule referred to as ATP. We understand that ATP is continually being used up, uh, and when it's used up, it's turned from ATP into ADP, and so ADP, adenosine diphosphate, must be replenished, must be transformed back into ATP in order for the cell to survive. The process that the cell uses to do this is referred to as cellular respiration, and that's going to be the topic of the last portion of this chapter. The process uses oxygen. Um, it's, it's mostly an aerobic process, and there are three steps to this process that we're going to discuss now. Most of these occur in the mitochondria. You, you may remember, hopefully you do, for a coming exam, that in chapter two we talked about the mitochondria as one organelle that's found in the cell. And the mitochondria is known as the powerhouse of the cell. It's where ATP is produced. So let's talk about these three steps. Step one is glycolysis. Glycolysis is the process that gets this whole process of cellular respiration going. Glycolysis takes a glucose molecule and so you understand what glucose is, you understand it's a monosaccharide that's made its way into the blood um, through diffusion. It then goes to the cells and diffuses into the cells uh, via diffusion. And glycolysis then uh, allows the six carbon glucose mo molecule to be broken down into two three carbon molecules called pyruvic acid. So envision the starting point as one six carbon glucose molecule, a molecule that has is six carbons in length. We chop that in half and now we have two three carbon pyruvic acid molecules. This takes place in the cytosol. So remember the cytosol is the watery portion of the cell found outside the organelles uh, uh, and the, the nucleus of the cell but inside the plasma membrane. Glycolysis interestingly is anaerobic. It does not require oxygen and it does produce some ATP. It produces two ATP molecules. And so glycolysis then can be used by your body to produce energy in situations in which your portions of your body have such a distinct and dramatic demand for oxygen that it can't be supplied by the body. And so that's why a sprinter is depicted on this particular slide. Anaerobic respiration occurs, for instance, when you run very fast for a very short period of time. And your muscles need so much oxygen during this time that your uh, body is not able to supply enough, but they still the muscles still need energy, and so energy is made anaerobically via glycolysis during this particular time. The problem with this is that waste products build up that can't be gotten rid of if oxygen is not present. And so pyruvic acid, for instance, builds up in the muscles, and this eventually leads to fatigue. And so this works for a very short period of time in the body, but not for an extended period of time. We have to go on to the next steps of cellular respiration to understand how cells can persist uh, and make energy for long periods of time. All right, so moving on then, we have step two, which is the citric acid cycle. And the citric acid cycle then does occur within the mitochondria. The citric acid cycle can be summed up by what I'm going to say right now. The citric acid cycle is the process of removing all of the electrons that are found in that three carbon pyruvic acid. If we look at our screen, we see the three carbon pyruvic acid and we see it feeding in to this circular structure on the screen there um, with a bunch of little green uh, molecules that are arranged into a circle. Each of those molecules represent a certain enzyme that plays a role in this cycle. And so pyruvic acid is passed from one enzyme to another and as it's passed from one to another electrons are extracted uh, from that pyruvic acid. And as this occurs, a couple things take place. One is that two ATP are produced, and we see those depicted in the screen there, and carbon dioxide is released. And so this is exactly why you're continually exhaling CO2. As the electrons are pulled off of pyruvic acid, the molecule falls apart and CO2 is released. And so the important part of this step is what is going to happen to those electrons? What's going to, where are those electrons going to go next? And so pay close attention to that particular topic. Where are those electrons going to go at this point? So interestingly, here's where they go. So this molecule called NADP plus uh, comes into the the picture at this point. And NAD, I'm sorry, it's NAD plus in this this particular case. 
Um, NADP plus will come in later in our uh, in our book in our uh, class. So NAD plus acts like a taxi. It comes and it picks up electrons, and when it picks up those electrons, it turns into NADH, and NADH then transports those electrons to the third step. Remember we said there are three steps. The third step of cellular respiration, which is the electron transport chain. So what we've accomplished so far is, the, is this, to, to brief, briefly review. We have taken glucose and in the process of glycolysis we've split it into two pyruvic acid molecules. We've taken those pyruvic acid molecules and in the process of the citric acid cycle we've extracted all the electrons from those pyruvic acid molecules. Those electrons have been loaded up into this uh, taxi, NAD+, uh, plus, which becomes NADH, and the electrons are on their way to the electron transport chain that we'll get to now. Here's the electron transport chain. Interestingly, to, to explain the electron transport chain, we need to understand a little bit about the mitochondria. So to review briefly from Chapter 2, we remember that the mitochondria has an outer and an inner membrane that we can see depicted on the diagram on this particular slide. Inside the inner membrane we have an area called the matrix and outside the inner membrane we have an area called the intermembrane space. So let's go on and, and understand how these spaces are important to the, the process of making ATP via the electron transport chain. Now here is the electron transport chain. Look very closely at this diagram. At one end of the electron transport chain electrons from NADH are dumped off onto that electron transport chain at the left hand side of this chain. So I'm pointing with the pointer here and here we see NADH, it dumps off an electron and it goes to the first protein of this electron transport chain. The protein is located on the border between, it's actually located on the inner membrane and so Inside this area, we have the matrix, and then outside that inner membrane, as we just pointed out, we have that intermembrane space. And so the electron goes from one carrier to the next carrier to the next carrier, as you can see depicted there, and eventually it is going to attach to oxygen down here to form water. So this electron transport chain acts like a, this conveyor belt, moving the electrons from one protein to another. Um, down this electron transport chain. And each electron has increasingly more attract, I'm sorry, each carrier of the electrons, each protein that we see here in the inner membrane space that's part of the electron transport chain has increasingly more attraction for these electrons. The first one has some attraction for electrons, the second one has more, the, the third one has even more, and finally oxygen has a very high attraction for electrons. So the electrons combined with oxygen to form water and that's the end of the electrons. And so at the end of this process then energy has been released because these electrons have gone from a place where they don't want to be, they don't want to be attached to NADH to a place where they do want to be, they do want to be attached to oxygen. And that's where the energy comes from that we see re uh, released in the process of aerobic respiration. And so here's how that energy is harnessed. It's a very simple and, and very interesting process. Every time an electron goes from this carrier, as I'm pointing here, to this carrier, to this carrier, a hydrogen atom is pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space. And so you can see as more and more electrons go down the electron transport chain, more and more hydrogens end up in this intermembrane space. As the hydrogens accumulate in the intermembrane space, you can ask yourself as a result of diffusion where do these hydrogen atoms want to go and you'll remember that diffusion is the movement of particles from an area of high concentration to low concentration so to move down a concentration gradient they want to go back where they came from they want to go back into the matrix but they can't because of this inner membrane and so interestingly this is where the production of ATP actually comes in the electrons move through the protein that we see here and this protein is referred to as ATP synthase. Um, and as these, I'm going to go back to the diagram so we can look at a picture. As these hydrogen atoms move through this protein called ATP synthase, then this is what happens. It, it's oftentimes depicted as an old time uh, mill where they ground corn. And so the water flowed past the big wheel that was part of the mill. It turned this wheel and then inside the mill 
something was the, attached to the wheel was turning and work was accomplished. And so this same thing on, on an unbelievably small level occurs here. The hydrogen atoms flow back through this ATP synthase and as they flow through, uh, work is done. ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is combined with one phosphate and so of course if you take two phosphates and add one you have how many phosphates and the answer obviously is three you have three phosphates um, and so you regenerate ATP then and so this process is where most of the ATP that's produced in the process of cellular respiration is actually produced what we see is that a total of 26 ATP molecules are generated for every molecule of glucose that feeds into the to glycolysis, the beginning of this process.